Good morning. It is great to see you here this morning. We are very thankful as always. We have the, the wonderful privilege of worshiping our Heavenly Father and giving glory to the Christ, studying a portion of His Word together, and we're thankful that you've chosen to do that with us this morning. Uh, appreciate so much the elders in those conversations, uh, the concern for the membership here, and the desire for you and I to grow spiritually. Uh, we're going to have some conversations and some studies about that as we move forward. It seems no matter where we start in a, in a Bible discussion, in my mind, I always feel like that's not the place to start because I feel like we should go backward and then understand some things that leads us to where we need to be to begin. And that's kind of what we're going to do this morning. If you have your Bibles and you're there in 1 Thessalonians 4, you see verse number 3 has a phrase in it. It actually says, and this is the will of God, even your sanctification. And that's kind of how uh, we'll start this morning, the will of God. It is important that we understand that, and we'll talk about sanctification and salvation tonight. And so if you come back and you study along with us, we'll take that time to begin the process of studying the difference between sanctification and salvation as it relates to our ongoing growth and spiritual development. But this morning, this seems like an appropriate place to begin because the will of God is so important. Now, the question might be, why? Why is knowing the will of God important? Let me offer you several reasons. Number one, knowing the will of God and doing the will of God is how we're going to go to heaven. How important is that? In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, Jesus said, Not everyone who saith unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Man, he will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do many wonderful things in your name and cast out demons in your name? Then would I profess to them, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Here are some religious people believing themselves to be doing things in the name of the Lord. In fact, that's what they say. We did this in your name. We did this in mind of pleasing you, only to hear Jesus say, you did not actually do the will of my Father. Therefore, Going to heaven will be determined by doing the will of God. It's important for us to know it. Secondly, if you have your Bibles, look at Matthew chapter 15. Why is knowing the will of God important? Well, if you and I don't know God's will, then we will follow the doctrines and commandments of men. That's what Jesus warns about in Matthew chapter 15. There are individuals who will do just as these Pharisees and scribes did. They come to Jesus in verse number 1, and they ask him, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Is washing your hands before you eat bread the will of God? Is that something God enjoins? It's something they enjoin. In fact, Jesus answered and said to them, Why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? You'll note the two things. There's the commandments of God. There's the tradition of men. Which one will you do? If you don't know the will of God, then you'll fall into this same dynamic as these people. In fact, Jesus says, you set aside God's commands so you can keep your own traditions. How frequently does this happen? And why does it happen? Because people don't know the will of God. Another reason is these individuals who do this will bind upon you grievous burdens. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 23. The same individuals there in Matthew 12 and, and, and Matthew 15, if you continue to read that down to verse 14, Jesus will say that every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Their methodologies are not going to work in the end. In Matthew 23, Jesus again chides them, but notice what he says. The scribe, he said to the crowds and the disciples, the scribe and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, all that they tell you to do, observe and do, but do not according to their deeds, for they say and do not. It's interesting that the person who makes the rules is generally exempt from the rules they made. But they want you to do it. They bind upon you heavy burdens. In fact, as our Lord continues, notice verse number four. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with their finger. <laughs> 
They won't even lift them, but boy, they sure. What happens if you don't know the will of God? Somebody will step in between you and God and give you their teachings and their traditions, and then they will bind them upon you, these heavy, grievous burdens. You will be trying to bear them and carry them out. Ultimately, that's not the will of God at all. One more reason. Romans chapter 10. If you don't know the will of God, then you will go about, as Paul says here, you will be left to go about and establish your own righteousness. That's what he says about the Jews. He says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Since they lack this knowledge of God, what happens in verse number three? For not knowing about God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Since they didn't know what God required, they just went about and did their own thing, believing that would justify. Well, God is the justifier, not us. We don't invent things. We don't come up with things and then decide by doing this, therefore God will justify me. That's not the way it works at all. And so it's exceedingly important to know the will of God. Secondly, the efficacy of your prayers will be determined by God's will. I trust that you have a fervent and robust prayer life, which every Christian should. That's just wonderful. But that is according to the will of God. In Luke chapter 1 and verse number 11, the Bible says, It came to pass as he was praying in a certain place with reference to Jesus, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. If I were to say that prayer is a subject that needs to be studied, it would be a woeful understatement. It absolutely needs to be studied, that's for sure. It's complex, it's large, there's a lot of parts to it. It absolutely needs to be studied. But not many people study it. In fact, not many people ask to be taught it. Here are some Jewish men who grew up praying, no doubt. But when they saw Jesus pray, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Weren't they praying people? Very likely. And yet, they realized there's something we don't know clearly about prayer. We need to learn that. Not many Christians have ever asked, teach me how to pray. Where would you go to learn how to pray? May I suggest the Scriptures, the will of God. It would be in there. Look at 1 John chapter 5, and notice how John connects prayer to the will of God. At the very least, the answering of prayers, the efficacy and power of prayer— in 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 11, John says, and this is the testimony, this is the record that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Notice verse number 13. These things I have written unto you who believe. And we were to pause there and talk just briefly. It's interesting that John is writing to people who believe. And yet to people who believe, note what he says next. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. If anybody should know they have eternal life, shouldn't it be those who believed in the name of the Son of God? And yet clearly, John says, I'm writing because apparently they do not. At the very least, they don't have confidence in it. How many Christians live the exact same life? I'm not very confident. I don't really know. I'd like to know. John moves from verses 11 to 13 and connects it to prayer and the will of God. Verse number uh, 14, he says, and this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. Go back and look at those passages again and begin with this word. John says, this is the confidence. How confident you are you in your prayer life? This is the confidence that we have. There are a lot of people who pray, pray, pray. I used to pray. Some have stopped. I used to pray, but God never answered. I used to pray, but I didn't get what I wanted. I used to pray, but I don't really believe that God. And then somebody comes along and tries to help them and say, well, you got to wait on the Lord. You know what people do when you say stuff like that? They look at their watches. <laughs> 
And they generally say things like, I've been waiting. Oh, no, you got to wait longer because your timetable is not God's timetable. How do you know that? And how do you know what his timetable is? But really what they mean is just keep waiting. That's what they mean. It's a very little help, actually, at all. John uses the word confidence. How's yours? This is the confidence that we have, but he doesn't just use the word confidence. John uses the word know several times in these two verses. In fact, it's prominent throughout his writings. We know, we know, we know, we absolutely know. Well, what do we know, John? John says this confidence that we have before him that if we ask anything, here's our phrase, according to his will. What will happen if we ask according to his will? Friends, don't let me make this up. You read it too. See if it's in your Bible. If we ask, John's words, inspiration's word, according to his will, he hears us. Fantastic. That is an outstanding start. What will happen if he hears us? The very next verse says, and we know. And we know that if he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we ask of him. What's the only caveat? According to his will. In fact, John continues by saying, even praying for other people then is connected to that. Note the very next two verses. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give for him life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that you should make requests for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. There is a sin that doesn't lead to death. Great. And there is a sin which does lead to death. Great. Which one is which? How do I know? What is the determination? In fact, John says, for that one, don't pray. Don't pray for that. How would I know that? I would need to know his will. Brings us to this question. How do we determine that? Okay, Eric, I followed you so far. Thank you for following along. So how do we determine his will? It's a great question. If you have your Bibles, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 with me, and let's talk about it. First Corinthians chapter 2, as you open up the book of Corinthians, you began reading, Paul is immediately concerned with the brethren there in Corinth because of the divisions, at the very least, that is happening. Now, there are a lot of challenges in Corinth as they seek to grow and, well, talk about our subject for the next several weeks, sanctify themselves in the Lord. As they seek to do that, they're encompassing or encountering a lot of problems. Among them is division. And Paul addresses that beginning in verse 10 down to about verse 17, ultimately asking, is Christ divided? And the answer is obviously no, he's not. And so the church shouldn't be divided. Just speak the same thing and be of the same mind and the same judgment. That's the way it should be. But beginning in verse 18, down through chapter 2 and maybe as far over as chapter 4, Paul begins to talk about wisdom. He begins to talk about divine wisdom and human wisdom. And he makes a contrast between the two. He uses both the Jew and the Gentile as an example and their reaction to the Christ on the cross. And so if you were to read verse 18 forward, he will say in verse 18, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The, both the Jews and the Gentiles ultimately interpreted as foolishness. The Greeks, he will say, they seek after a sign. It's foolishness to them. But the Jews, it became a stumbling block to them. And so as he begins this discussion, he talks about his preaching. Begin with me at chapter 2 and notice verse number 1. He says, and when I came to you, brethren, that would be Acts chapter 18, when he came into Corinth and preached the gospel unto them. He says, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. If you read Acts 18, you will know he just left Athens in Acts 17, where human wisdom was on full display. And Paul says, when I came to you, I did not bring that to you. I did not come into Corinth with human wisdom. Verse number two, he continues, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ 
and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. I can relate. Sometimes preaching is tough. You stand up before audiences. You make the mistake of opening your eyes and looking at their faces. And sometimes there's trembling involved. There's nervousness involved. I can relate to what Paul is saying. Absolutely. One man said, I'm glad there's a pulpit. They can't see my knees shaking. I can relate. Paul says, and I came, brethren, I did not come with some huge fanfare and some great oration. No, I, I came speaking Jesus Christ and him crucified. Notice verse 4 and verse 5. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of spirit and the power. Why? So that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. And so Paul wants them to understand. There's a difference between human wisdom and divine wisdom. However, he does want them to understand, I do have wisdom. I don't have that kind of wisdom. I didn't bring that to you. But notice what he says immediately in verse 6, almost anticipating they may think he doesn't have any. He says, yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom. Note the next phrase, in a mystery. Even, he, he says, in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. How do we learn the will of God? Keep reading. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I had not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the hearts of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man. Let's go back just a, a quick moment. Paul says, we do speak wisdom. Where did you get that wisdom, Paul? He says, no eye ever saw it, no ear ever heard it, no mind ever imagined it, okay? It did not come from humans. Where did you get it? He says, God has revealed it unto us by his spirit. How do we know the will of God? He has to reveal it to us by the spirit, and he has. You have in your possession the revelation of God. You have in your possession his mind made known. If you want to know the will of God, in order to pray according to the will of God, you'd have to know the will of God. Well, how can you know it? You can't read his mind. How do you know I can't read his mind? I know you can't read his mind because you can't even read the mind of the person sitting next to you. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? That simply means that you and I have a spirit inside of us, and that spirit knows our mind. We know what we're thinking. Nobody else knows what we're thinking, and aren't you glad? I know I am. I'm glad you don't know what I'm thinking. It gives me time to change what I'm thinking. But when will you know what I'm thinking? When we reveal it in words. When we say what we're thinking, when we take the thought and put it to words and we make known our minds, now I know what you're thinking. In fact, if you've ever told somebody, I know what you're thinking, please stop saying that. You don't know what they're thinking or the Bible's not right. And the Bible's right and you're wrong. So you don't know what other people are thinking. Typically what happens is somebody will say, well, I know what he's thinking. That's usually coming from a wife with a husband that she's had for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. And she said, well, I know what he's thinking. Typically what, what she means by that is I have been with this man since we were 21, 22, and now we're 67, 68. I've been with him so long. And what she has watched and observed and listened to is him making choices between two things. And so she's observed that he likes, um, he, he, he likes Rocky Road. He doesn't like strawberry. He likes pies. He doesn't like cakes. And of the pies he likes, it's apple. Now, how does she know that? Well, she never actually read his mind. He told her, and he showed her. 
and she's watched it over and over and over and over again. And now if you ask her, what's he want to drink? Oh, he'll have a Coke. Well, he didn't say that, so how do you know that? I've watched that man pick Cokes for the last 40 years. <laughs> what's he drinking? Coke. Uh, she'll have a sweet tea. How do you know that? Well, I've seen her every time we sit down in a restaurant. She says, sweet tea, please. He will have no, no non-sweet tea. Let me have an unsweet tea. How do you know that? Listen, this is not mind reading. This is choice observing. If you want to mind read, grab a stranger. Look into their eyes and then tell them what they're thinking. There is one who can do this. 1 Samuel 16, 7, it's God. Look not on his stature, for I have rejected him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Nobody else can do that. What's Paul's point? If you and I can't read each other's mind, who can read God's mind? How will you know what God wants you to do if he doesn't reveal it to you? You can take your time, and you will still not come up with what God wants unless he reveals it. You can't feel God's will. You, you can't experience God's will. And I'm not here to minimize the power of feelings. There are some times you have such a strong urge to do something, such a hunch to do something. You feel so compelled by it that you act as if, if I didn't do it, I would make them. I got to do that. That's nothing, nothing in the world wrong with that. But you can't say that's the will of God. Not accurately, you can't, because God didn't reveal that. And your hunches don't, don't, don't reveal the will of God. Your guesses your senses, they don't reveal the will of God. In fact, you should reject all subjective hunches, signs, symbols, palm reading, card readings, zodiacs, numerology, urges, mysticism, and anything else that goes in that basket. You should reject that outright because that's not how you know the will of God. The will of God must be revealed. In fact, when I say that nobody can read God's mind, I don't want you to start with the people in this room. You should start with Adam on day six. No one has ever had the capacity to read God's mind. In fact, we read it so quickly, it's almost as if it's just old hat. But let me ask you this. How did Adam know which trees were acceptable and which trees were forbidden? If you say, because God told him, well, you're making my point. He couldn't have known that God had forbid a tree unless God said, don't eat of that one. You can eat of all of these, don't eat of that one. How did Noah know to make an ark? God told him, and this is the way it works. If you're going to know the will of God, you must have revelation. See an example of it. If you have your Bibles, turn back to the book of 2 Samuel. It does not matter who you are, 2 Samuel chapter 7, if you're turning. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your position. It doesn't matter what you know. It doesn't matter how God has used you. None of that matters. When it comes to knowing the will of God, the only way to know that is by revelation. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, beginning in verse number 1, we are reading a private conversation between two men. These two men are not just anybody. They're both prophets, and one of them is a king. And he is referred to as a man after God's own heart. Listen to the conversation, beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, Now it came about when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest on every side from all his enemies. If you read the life of David, you know how significant that is. He has now rest from all of his enemies. He's living comfortably in his house. So then, verse number 2, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within tent curtains. What's he talking about? David looks at his house, and it must be grand and palatial. It must be a wonderful residence. He says it's made of cedar. It's a wonderful house. And then he says, I look at where God is living, and God is living in a movable tent outside. 
Well, what's the movable tent? It's the tabernacle that Moses built in Exodus 25 and following. That tabernacle is still a part of Israel's life. And David said, I'm looking at my house, and I'm looking at God's house, and clearly God deserves a better house than I have. Who wouldn't agree with that? Well, everybody would agree. God deserves better than you, David. I got it. And so David now says we should do something about it. What, what are you going to do? Well, keep reading. Nathan said to the king, go, do all that is in your mind, for the Lord is with you. You know, if it's in your mind and you say, I'm going to do this for God, and then another faithful, righteous person confirms it, by all means, do all that's in your heart. Well, then it's got to be right. There's no way y'all both can be wrong. I mean, one prophet and king said, I'm going to do this for God, and another prophet said, well, go on and do it. In fact, he added those last three words, the Lord is with you. Everybody's weighed in on the house building except the one for whom it's being built. But he does. Notice the very next verse. The Bible says in verse number four, but in the same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, Go and say to my servant David, thus says the Lord, are you the one who should build me a house to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought the sons of Israel from Egypt, even to this day, but I have a moving, been moving about in a tent, even in a tabernacle. Wherever I have gone with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house? Did I ever say that? Is there any revelation from me on the subject? No, there's not. In fact, if you were to keep reading, what God will say to David is, when you are asleep with your fathers, I'll build you a house. In fact, he says, I'm going to establish the seed, your seed's house forever. Ultimately, it's a prophecy about the Christ who will come from the seed of David, Matthew 1, 1, Romans 1, 4, and 5. He will be declared the Son of God, Son of David, with uh, the Son of God with power in his resurrection, but he's from the seed of David, Matthew 1, 1. And God says, he will build my house, and he does. David will be asleep with his fathers when this occurs, Acts chapter 2. In the meantime, Solomon, David's son, will build God's house, the temple. What's the point? The point is, they didn't know the mind of God on this subject. But they were prophets. They were. They were prophets, and what do prophets do? They speak forth the revelation of God. What if there's no revelation? Well, then they're speaking out of their own mind. There was no revelation on this subject to David and Nathan, and so David came up with a great idea, but it wasn't the will of God. In fact, God says, quite frankly, it's just the opposite. You will not build my house. What's my point to you? If you don't know the will of God, whose will are you doing? Without revelation, you can't know it. If you and I are to pray according to God's will, and if the will of God is our sanctification, then we have to know the will of God, which inevitably then takes us back to Scripture. If you were to read the book of Philemon, chapter 1, verses 10 down to about verse 17, you will hear Paul talking to Philemon about the events in the life of Onesimus. Onesimus ran away from Philemon, and of all the people in all the world he met was the apostle Paul. Having met Paul, Paul taught him the gospel, and Onesimus became a Christian. Paul then writes this letter back to Philemon, and now he says, receive him even as myself. He wasn't useful for you, but he's useful now. And interpreting the events, Paul does not say, this was the will of God. That's probably what we would say. What else could it be after all? A man runs away, he meets Paul, he obeys the gospel. Surely that's got to be of God. God had to have a hand in that. The apostle Paul treaded very lightly and carefully, and in verse number 15, he says, for perhaps he left you for a season that you might receive him back forever. Do you know for sure, Paul? I don't. Why don't you know? I don't have any revelation. Since God didn't tell me why Onesimus ran away, I don't actually know. 
And since God didn't tell me why we met and how we met, I don't actually know. And because I don't know, I won't say I do. I'll say, perhaps we should all be so careful and wise. There is, like there are with almost every study, other studies involved in God's will. Among them would be a study of prayer, would be a study of providence, miracles, the mystery, and on and on one would go. All that said then, what has God revealed? Before we get there, let me say this. The word will, with reference to God, means at least two things. It's used two different ways. The definition ultimately is going to involve, uh, Mound says it is the will, the bent, the inclination, a will, a purpose, a design. Strong says it's a determination, properly a thing that is a choice, a purpose, a decree. Thayer says it's what one wishes or has determined shall be done. Of the purpose of God to bless mankind through Christ, of what God wishes us or, or desires to be done. And that really is ultimately how it breaks down. With reference to God, it has the idea of something God has decreed that will be done or something that God desires to be done. He provides the means for it to happen. He provides all of the things necessary, and he would have this happen rather than that happen. We'll talk about those two things tonight and note the differences between them. This morning, we'll talk about what God has decreed. What is with reference to the will of God? Three large areas, if you will allow. Number one would be the scheme of redemption. The very thread that runs through our whole Bible, that's the will of God. In fact, that's the decree of God. The second thing would be sanctification. For those who are saved, those who are saved then are to be sanctified. We just read that, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse number 3. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. Hard to say that's not what it is when the Scripture says that's what it is. This is the will of God. The third thing is sharing the gospel with the lost. That's God's will. Those last two have to do with desire. That first one has to do with decree. The scheme of redemption is the will of God. As you read your Bible, it's imperative that you understand this. When you open up the Bible, you find God at work. He's building. In fact, that would be a good way to describe the activity of the Godhead, both in material creation and ultimately in regeneration. In material creation, each member of the Godhead plays a role in bringing the creation into existence. We read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. It takes us some time and revelation to unfold, but we get to John chapter 1, and we learn, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And so then we see the Father, we see the Word, and we see the Spirit. This is how the world is made, each member having a part. If this were a construction site, if you'll allow the analogy, in this scenario, the Father would be the architect. Throughout Scripture, he is going to be presented as the one who purposes, the one who plans, the one who prepares. That's going to be the work of the Father. It's as if he wrote out the plan and, and drew up what would be in material creation. In this analogy, then, the second member of the Godhead would be the builder, the construction worker, the one who would take the plans of the Father and bring them into existence. God said, let there be light. There was light. All things were made by or through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Our house now built, days one through five, the Holy Spirit would be the interior designer, the one who garnishes and beautifies and finishes. The Holy Spirit would do that work. And as you read through the Bible, that is the way the world will be presented. But then sin enters 
into the world in Genesis chapter 3. And what we learn is the Father, the Word, and the Spirit went back to work this time, not in material creation, but in spiritual regeneration. They're going to provide the means for our souls to be saved. If we were reading the Bible, we might read then Genesis to Malachi. The Father will be the prime mover in making all of these events happen. The seed of woman of Genesis 3 and verse 15, the promises to Abraham in Genesis 12, the call of Moses, the leadership of Joshua, the judges, the kings, the prophets, the captivity, the return, the remnant, all the way through the Old Testament, the Father is working to prepare for the coming of the second member of the Godhead. We open up the book of Matthew, the New Testament, we're immediately introduced to the second member of the Godhead. John says, the Word became flesh. Remember the builder. Who's going to take the plan of redemption and actually put it into action and die for our sins? The Word made flesh, John 1 and verse number 14. He will, a body will be prepared for him. Why? So that he could die. This is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, born of a woman, the fulfillment of prophecy. The things written of me must be fulfilled, Luke 24, 44 to 49. His birth, his life, his teaching, his death, burial, and resurrection. Well, that'll take us right up to the book of Acts. But sure enough, before the book of Acts, John 13, 14, 15, 16, our Lord will say to the apostles, I must go away. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house of many mansions. I'll not leave you orphans. I'll not leave you. I will send the comforter. Here is our Lord right before his death saying to the apostles, I will not leave you alone. I will send the Comforter. We open up the book of Acts, and what do we find? Our Lord spending 40 days with the apostles, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom, and then Acts 1, 9 through 11, ascending out of their sight, and in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit coming. Whose work? From Acts to the Revelation, the Spirit will work. Acts 13, 2, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work which I have for them to do. The Father has worked, the Word has worked, and now the Spirit works. And eventually and ultimately, that mystery will be complete. This is the will of God. This is the way Jesus talked about it. Look at a couple of passages with me. Look over in Matthew 26. You remember our Lord in the garden. Three times saying the same prayer. Verse 39, what is it that he prayed? He went a little beyond them, fell on his face, and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet, not as I will, but what? Your will be done. Whose will? The Father's will. Let that be done. He says it again in verse 42. He says it again in verse 44. Look over in the book of John and listen to him talk to the apostles. This is the event where he has the Bible study with the woman at the well from Samaria. And in John chapter 4, the apostles have gone away to get him food. Now that they've come back, the woman now gone, they press Jesus to eat. And in verse 31, meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. So the disciples said one to another, who brought him food while we were away? Who did that? Jesus said, my meat, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. What are you doing, Lord? My father has been working. That's what the very next chapter says. Look at John 5, 17. Jesus says there, verse number 17, but he answered them saying, my father has been working. My father is working and now I work. My father has been working, and now I'm working. Verse number 18 says, For this reason the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only broke in the Sabbath, but he said that God was his father, they understood, making himself equal with God. In fact, that's what the Godhead is. When Jesus says, I will send you another 
comforter, that's not the same word in Galatians 1 where Paul says, I marvel you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel. That another is not the same as this one. That right there in Galatians 1 is another of a different kind. This word in John 16, Jesus says, I will send you another of the same kind. Just as I and my Father are the same, the Holy Spirit is the same. This is the work of the divine nature. The entire Godhead is participating in the redemption of humanity, each playing a very significant, prominent role. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that the Christ or the Word and the Spirit are not active in the Old Testament, because they are. In fact, anybody who speaks by inspiration is doing so by the power of the Holy Spirit, whether that be the Old Testament or the New Testament. 2 Samuel 23, 2, David said, the Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and His Word was in my tongue. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to inspire, to reveal the Word of God. In fact, the product you hold in your hand or on your tablet or read daily is the result of the Spirit's work. See 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Those holy men were born along as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This portion of the work of God is the will of God. This could not fail. There was no way for it to fail. The gates of hell couldn't prevent it. Death couldn't prevent it. Why? 1 John 4.4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Who could stop God from doing that which he decreed would be done? There's not a person. There's no one, no angel, no wickedness. Nothing could stop God from doing and carrying out his will. In fact, if you ha well, we'll do that another time. It'll take up too much time. <laughs> Look at Acts chapter 2. As we draw uh, to an end, do you like being told as we draw to an end? Do you enjoy that phrase? You know, sometimes they say to preachers, don't tell people that. Don't tell people as you draw to an end. Why not? Because unless you end... And I'm going to appreciate that. I really am going to end, though. I just want you to read this in Acts chapter 2. With reference to Christ's coming, and there are other passages we could read. Psalm 2 comes to mind. Why did the heathen rage? People imagine a vain thing. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 19 comes to mind. But I want you to listen to how Peter describes our Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. In Acts chapter 2, with, with standing before the audience of the people who actually had a hand in putting him to death, Peter connects both God's wisdom and counsel and determinations with their individual choices and freedoms. And in Acts 22, he says, Acts 2 rather, verse 22, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered to the cross. How was he delivered? By the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain him. Well, if God determined it, how are they wicked? Because God's determination never overrides human freedom. God was going to see to it that it happened, but you didn't have to participate. He didn't force you down there agreeing with Pilate. He didn't force you down there saying, crucify him, crucify him. He didn't put you in the crowd. You did that. And so as they stand there hearing these things, it was their own wicked hands that did it. And they're each responsible for that, which is why they ask, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then they're told, repent and be baptized, because the whole point of God's plan was to provide the means for their salvation. That is the will of God. 
And you could note any other passages about it, but that is at least when we began with trying to talk about sanctification, we began understanding that 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, this is the will of God. There is something that God desires relative to each one of his children as they grow and mature in him. The relationship doesn't end at baptism, it begins. And from there, God has a desire, God has a will for you. That first part is finished. Revelation 10 and verse number 7, the Bible says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he has declared to his servants, the prophets. The plan of salvation, the mystery of God, what God was doing to bring the Christ, God has revealed that. That portion of God's will is finished. Tonight, we'll look at the differences between the second two aspects, salvation and sanctification. What does that mean to a child of God? Hope you can come back tonight and study along with us, and we'd love to, love to have it so. Ultimately, all that God did was so you could be saved. That's what it's all about. You are that important to God that he would purpose and plan from eternity to bring the Christ to die for your sins. Would you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? John 8, 24, that's what you're reading in Acts chapter 2. They're preaching that. Because of sin, those people cry out, and they tell them, repent. Would you do that this morning? Change your heart and your mind and give yourself to God this morning. Confess the name of Jesus and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. Baptize with him. Rise and walk in newness of life. The Bible would say that's God's will for your life. Friends, if you've never done that, you haven't obeyed the will of God. And if you don't obey the will of God, Matthew 7 says, Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter, but he that does the will of my Father. The will of God is that you began by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ this very morning never done that. We implore you, beg you, beseech you. Become a Christian this morning as we stand and as we sing.